Hi everybody. This session is about diabetic ketoacidosis in children. This talk is made simple for teaching the management of DKA, so it will not include literature review or a lot of detailed explanations. First, I will review DKA diagnosis and pathophysiology, then I will talk about management strategies including IV fluid, insulin administration, and monitoring. And at the end, I will discuss briefly about cerebral edema as one of the most serious complications in DKA patient. What is DKA? The name diabetic ketoacidosis tell us all the features of this disease. It happens in diabetic children who are known to have diabetes or this is their first presentation. So hyperglycemia is the first finding with high glucose level of at least 11 millimole per liter. The other feature is ketosis that you may detect in the urine, ketonuria, or in the blood, ketonemia. The third feature is metabolic acidosis, and for diagnosis, you need pH to be less than 7.30 and or by carb less than 15. What does that mean? You can diagnose the patient with DKA if other features are present with pH alone, by carb alone, or both if they are below the specified level. The reason behind that, because pH is determined not only by bicarb but by BCO2 level as well. Patient pH can be above 7.30 if hyperventilating and washing out CO2 as a trial to compensate. In the other hand, bicarb can be above 15 while pH is below 7.30. So presence of one of them is enough if the patient has hyperglycemia and ketosis with metabolic acidosis. DKA severity can be categorized to mild, moderate, and severe according to the pH level and or by carb level, as you can see in this slide. What is the pathophysiology? DKA is caused by insulin deficiency. Deficiency of circulating insulin and increased level of the counter-regulatory hormones result in accelerated catabolic state with increased glucose production by the liver and the kidney, and simultaneously impaired peripheral glucose utilization. All these factors result in hyperglycemia, hyperosmolarity, increased lipolysis, and ketogenesis, leading to ketonemia and metabolic acidosis. Hyperglycemia together with hyperketonemia cause osmotic diuresis, dehydration, and obligatory loss of the electrolytes. And that is why DKA patients are usually severely dehydrated and volume depleted, leading to hyperperfusion that will end up in lactate production and acidosis. Thus, DKA leads to a vicious life-threatening cycle of events, ranging from hyperglycemia, hyperkutinemia, osmotic diuresis, severe vomiting, dehydration, and subsequently loss of electrolytes, greater stress hormone production, and more severe insulin resistance. If this vicious cycle is not interrupted by exogenous insulin, fluid, and electrolyte therapy, it will lead to fatal dehydration, hypoperfusion, and ultimately severe metabolic acidosis. These are the symptoms and signs that can be seen in patients with DKA. Patients who are severely acidotic and very dehydrated can have confusion or altered level of consciousness. How you evaluate and manage patients with DKA? This is the most important part of this talk. Those investigations are sent on presentation, and some of them are repeated every few hours throughout the treatment. CBC is sent to check white cell count as indicator of infection, but keep in mind that DKA patient, because of stress, can have high count without presence of infection. 
blood gases to check pH and bicarb, glucose level to detect hyperglycemia, and since the patient with DKA can have a lot of electrolyte imbalance, you have to check sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride, magnesium, and phosphate. Urea and creatinine to see kidney function, and to diagnose ketosis, either to do your urine ketone or beta hydroxybutyrate for uh, ketonemia. If the patient has any history uh, or symptoms or signs that may suggest infection, infection workup is sent as infection is one of the trigger of DKA and should be treated promptly if uh, present. The goals of the management of DKA patient include correct dehydration, correct the acidosis and reverse ketosis, treat hyperglycemia, and monitor and treat the complications. Achieving these goals is done by multiple therapeutic actions, but we always stress a very important point, which is prevention of complications, especially cerebral edema, which is fatal. The other extremely important point is you have to follow your hospital guideline or protocol. The first treatment which is administered in all patients with DKA is fluid. DKA patients are assumed to have 5 to 10 percent fluid deficit and usually are given a small uh, bolus of 10 ml per kg normal saline. It should be given slowly over 30 to 60 minutes unless they have hypotensive shock. The amount and the type of fluid and how it's calculated varies from guideline to guideline and as I said, you have to know your hospital or unit guideline, but otherwise all the main domains of the therapeutic strategies are the same. In one guideline, the maintenance is given over a 24 hour and the deficit is given over 24 to 48 hour. In other guideline, uh, the patient is given 1.5% maintenance if, the, if their weight is less than 30 kg and double maintenance if their weight is more than 30 kg. Other guideline, the, it said to give a fluid uh, at the range of 2 to 4 ml per kg per hour. And in other guideline, the rate of fluid is calculated by uh, weight. In this guideline, for example, uh, they specify the rate of fluid according to the, to the weight. Also, in ISBAD clinical practice consensus guideline, they have a table uh, that indicating the weight and the rate of uh, fluid to be uh, uh, given. In this guideline, uh, the patient is given 1.5 maintenance if less than 30 kg and double maintenance if more than uh, 30 kg. How to calculate maintenance? There are different ways. This is one of the way to give 4 uh, per kg for the initial 10 kg, 2 per kg for the second 10 kg. Then if, there is, uh, if the weight is more than uh, 20 kg, uh, you will calculate 1 ml per kg. For example, if you have a patient uh, who is 25 kg, the maintenance fluid will be 65 ml per hour. So 1.5 maintenance will be 97.5 ml uh, per hour. It is important uh, to mention that the total fluid intake, it should include the IV fluid and the insulin infusion. The other important point, this is the starting uh, rate of fluid, but you have to adjust the amount of fluid or the rate of fluid according to the patient status, according to your clinical judgment, the initial volume received, and also the risk of cerebral edema, the input and output. So you have to, to strictly uh, measure the input and output for all those uh, patients. What fluid to start? The patient usually is started on isotonic fluid like normal saline or ringel lactate plus potassium if the potassium level is less than 5.5. Usually we target potassium of 4 to 5. Why? Because uh, as you know, the insulin will shift the potassium from intravascular 
to intracellular. So, if you didn't give potassium, the patient will suffer hypokalemia. Once the glucose level dropped below 15, or if the drop was very fast of more than 5 per hour, you will add D5. And once the glucose level dropped below 10, you will add D10. You will add dextrose only if the acidosis is still persistent. Otherwise, the patient will be ready to uh, change or to transition to subcutaneous. And it is very important to know that if the acidosis is still persistent and the glucose level is dropping, never discontinue or uh, reduce the insulin infusion because the insulin is not given only for hyperglycemia, it is given for uh, acidosis and to prevent catabolism. Some centers use double bag system, which is an amazing idea to prevent waste of IV fluid. In this case, you prepare two bags of, uh, of fluid for the patient. One bag contains saline and lights only, for example, 0.9% NaCl and 40 kCl uh, per liter of potassium. The second bag contains 10% dextrose in addition to the saline uh, and lights. So, for example, D10% plus 0.9% NaCl and 40 kCl uh, potassium. So, at the beginning, the patient will receive fluid from the first bag only, which contains 0.9% NaCl and 40 kCl per liter, and nothing from the second bag, which contains dextrose. Then you will monitor the glucose level, and once the glucose level dropped below 18, you will adjust the fluid. So 75% of the fluid will be from first bag, and 25% of the fluid from the second bag. Then you will adjust the amount of fluid received from each bag according to the glucose level. For example, if the glucose level reach uh, 10 to 11.9, so 25% of the fluid uh, will be from this bag and 75% of the fluid will be from this bag. And if the glucose level dropped below 10, so the patient will not receive anything from this bag and all the fluid will be received from this bag. So as you can see, in this way, you will only use two bags and you will not need to change the bag each time the glucose level uh, change. And even if the glucose level, for example, went up from 11.9 to um, 13, you will not need to change the bag and waste it. You will just, uh, again, titrate the fluid received from each bag uh, accordingly. So I just talked about fluid management so far. The second treatment that is started is insulin infusion. Never give insulin bolus and never start insulin before the initial fluid is done, which is typically around one hour. The insulin is started at the rate of 0.05 to 0.1 unit per kg per hour. Low dose insulin of uh, 0.05 came from randomized control trial, which showed that low dose is non inferior to standard dose with respect to rate of blood glucose decrease and resolution uh, of acidosis. Close monitoring is an essential part of DKA management, and that is why this patient usually admitted in high dependency unit or BICU. Clinically, you need to monitor neurovitals for any development of brain injury, especially cerebral edema. Vital signs for hemodynamic strict input and output and arrhythmia, uh, especially those patients are uh, at risk of development of electrolyte imbalance. And also, you will monitor the patient for infection. Biochemically, glucose every one hour and gases, lights every two hours, extended lights, urea and creatinine. And these frequencies can be adjusted according to the patient status and uh, based on the clinical improvement. Also, you need to monitor the patient for, for ketosis by urine ketones or uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate. Transition to subcutaneous insulin is dependent on uh, mainly two factors. 
if the patient is able to take orally so is not sleeping or not sleepy and not vomiting and if the patient uh, pH uh, reach more than 7.30 and by carb is more than 15 millimole per liter the patient will be started initially on uh, subcutaneous insulin then after 30 minutes the insulin infusion will be discontinued The patient of DKA can develop complications because of DKA itself or because of the treatment. Cerebral edema, which is very uh, life-threatening condition and it can uh, lead to death. Uh, electrolyte imbalance, including hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, and uh, hypoglycemia. Venous thrombosis because of dehydration and increased uh, blood viscosity and acute renal failure because of uh, severe dehydration and hypoperfusion and other and some patients can develop pancreatitis as well cerebral edema is the leading cause of dka mortality in children there are multiple uh, risk factors for cerebral edema that include new onset patients who are less than five years and in patients with severe acidemia and severe hypocapnia also, if the insulin was administered during the first hour of resuscitation and in patients with high blood urea nitrogen and lower initial, uh, initial bicarb. Treatment with bicarb is another risk factor and that is why we don't uh, give those patients uh, bicarb even if they have severe acidosis unless they are hemodynamically very unstable. Patients with cerebral edema may develop multiple signs and symptoms that include headache, vomiting, irritability, altered level of consciousness, also may develop seizure, cranial nerve palsies, and posturing. And because of high ICB, may have bradycardia, hypertension, and abnormal breathing pattern. It is very important to mention that the diagnosis of cerebral edema is a clinical diagnosis. So if you suspected a patient to have a cerebral edema because of these signs and symptoms, first you have to treat and treat and treat and after that think about doing head imaging. Doing head imaging before treatment may lead to deterioration of the case and the patient may develop a cerebral herniation. The treatment of cerebral edema include giving hypertonic saline 3%, 2.5 to 5 ml per kg over 10 to 15 minutes. Also, you may give 20% manitol 0.5 to 1 gram per kg uh, over 10 to 15 minutes. And at this case, you have to reduce the rate of fluid administration by 30%. If the patient is not on BICU, you have to consult BICU to start neuroprotective measures that include elevation of the head of the bed to around 30 degree, uh, targeting normothermia, normoglycemia, and hypernatremia of at least 145 and above, and also if the patient is ventilated to uh, target strict BCO2 of 35 to 40. In summary, DKA is a life-threatening event that needs prompt diagnosis and treatment. Careful fluid therapy and insulin administration are very important. The patient needs meticulous monitoring of the clinical and biochemical parameters, and uh, DKA can be associated with life-threatening uh, complications. Thank you very much for your uh, listening.